So uh, we start in our, our last and final session. Um, last week, we looked at the idea of Zionism as a revolution in Jewish history. Um, the world and vision that came from different sides of, of the Zionist politics to create a new Jew or a new Hebrew within Zionism. It is a big question if this uh, will or vision um, actually materialized in reality. So of course, not, the answer is that uh, not completely. We know very well that not all uh, Jews that came to live in uh, Palestine, in Eretz Israel, uh, became uh, socialists from the left uh, hand side. We also know very clearly that not all of them joined the Beitar movement. However, I think it's fair to say that the Zionist movement did change three major dimensions in Jewish existence. And from this perspective, it was for sure a revolution in a Jewish life, in Jewish history. The first, uh, first revolution was practically turning Eretz Israel, the land of Israel, into the national home of the Jews, a home for millions of Jews, and eventually creating a Jewish state in, the, in this land. And this for sure was a reality that did not exist um, towards the end of the 19th century. So that's a complete uh, change in Jewish existence. Um, the second revolution, is uh, developing Jewish armed forces and eventually a Jewish army. Uh, no doubt this was a complete revolution and change in the condition of Jews and power, as we explained it last week, and a change in the deepest way one can imagine. And the third revolution was turning Hebrew into a national modern language for the Jews when only a few decades before Zionism, Hebrew was hardly used um, by a majority of the Jewish people as a day-to-day -day language. So um, I'll say the three again, creating a national home and eventually a state for millions of Jews, developing a Jewish army and turning Hebrew into a national modern language. So, after looking at these three dimensions of revolution, I want to focus today at least on one aspect of the relationship between Jewish society and culture in Eretz Israel in the context of Zionism, its relationship with Jews that uh, stayed to live in exile, or if you want in diaspora, mainly in Europe, and of course, the most uh, important historical moment we want to look at is the Shoah, the destruction of a European Jewry in the, during the 1940s. Um, and the poetic work I want to look at today is uh, the two poems of Nathan Alterman, who offers a, ve a very interesting way to look at the relationship between these two centers of a Jewish existence. Um, but before we get there, I do need to give a historical introduction to put um, the Zionist revolution in a clear historical context. So this is something um, many young Israeli students uh, don't uh, remember or know or keep in mind. But the, the truth is that the Zionist revolution took place uh, during a time, an era that can probably be considered the worst times in Jewish history since the days of the Tanakh, the Bible, for, for thousands of years. I want to describe in a few minutes the different uh, stages of this uh, catastrophic uh, time. I'm saying again, this might be uh, something of like stating the obvious, but I think it's very important to keep this timeline in mind. So as we already mentioned during our first and second uh, sessions in this uh, short course, from the late 19th century and onwards, 
the Jewish world was attacked. From the outside, it was attacked um, with the powerful processes of secularization and assimilation, and then uh, great waves of anti-Semitism, both in Western and Central Europe and in Eastern Europe. And and from the inside, as we mentioned, Jewish society, Jewish existence was torn between many different and rival ways of life and ideologies. The next uh, catastrophic stage for Jewish existence was the first World War, World War I, which uh, really exposed, exposed the vulnerability of Jews. And from, I think, two main perspectives. First of all, in a very practical way, hundreds of thousands of Jews were actually living in the Eastern Front where Germans and the Austrian Empire on the one hand and the Russian Empire on the other hand um, were fighting each other in a very uh, long, long and hard war. Um, and many Jews were actually captured inside this war zone and suffered a lot. Uh, Jews of uh, Galicia, eastern parts of uh, the Austrian uh, border, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Another very important dimension that uh, the First World War exposed in Jewish existence was the fact that in most of the European armies who took part in this war, uh, there were Jewish sol soldiers, um, soldiers, officers, doctors, you name it. And in many cases, they found themselves fighting each other and even killing each other. Now, this for sure was a very um, clear demonstration of the problematic situation the Jewish people found itself in the age of emancipation. What is the definition of the Jews as a nation if they um, serve in armies that fight and kill each other? Close to the end of the First World War in 1917, took place the Bolshevik Revolution in Russia. And soon after that, a horrific uh, civil war began in Russia, mainly in the Ukraine. And um, many Israelis don't remember this, but it is the, the truth, the historical truth that we sometimes forget because of the Shoah, that during the civil war, there was a massive massacre of hundreds of thousands of Jews who live in the Ukraine. Uh, one more terrible chapter of suffering. Eventually the Bolsheviks of course won the uh, civil war and from, from the early 1920s until the 1940s, uh, Stalin's regime in the Soviet Union uh, persecuted Zionism, then the religious Jewish life, mainly Hasidism and in the, towards the uh, 1930s and 1940s and onwards, also the secular Yiddish world was, um, was uh, under a very strong attack by the Russian uh, government. And of course, when the Germans invaded Russia in 1941, many more millions of Jews were murdered by them. So this whole part of Jewish existence was under a terrible attack from the Bolshevik revolution, revolution, the early 1920s, and for the next 20, 25 years. Not only that, between the two world wars, East European Jews, again, the majority of Jews in the world at the time, from Poland and Lithuania in the north to Hungary and Romania in the south, found themselves living under extreme national regimes, governments, and most of them were anti-Semitic. And of course, from 1933, the Nazi party ruled Germany, leading Europe and then the world and the Jewish people to war and to destruction. So if you look from a wide historical perspective at all this, my point is very clear, I think. The small Zionist movement was creating a new, brave new world with something very heroic about it. But they were doing this when most world Jewry, Jewry was facing crisis and eventually complete destruction. So my question over here is, how did Zionist thought look at Jewish life in the diaspora 
during these catastrophic times. So uh, as we already hinted last week, a very dominant approach within Zionist thought was what we call in Hebrew, shlilat hagalut, the negation of the diaspora. This was a very deep logical understanding, but also something that came from intuition um, that life for Jews in the diaspora will lead no doubt to assimilation in some parts and to complete destruction in, the, in other parts of the world, definitely in Europe. And this is a notion, an idea that one can find in Zionist writings from the days of Herzl and onwards during the 1930s and eventually the 1940s. And Jabotinsky, which we discussed last week, uh, was uh, very uh, aware of, this, uh, of, this, uh, of the Jewish situation. I think that in a, maybe even a deeper level, maybe a psychological level, this idea of negation of the diaspora, Shlilata Galut, um, was a thought or a feeling that there's something deeply wrong, maybe even corrupt in a way, or maybe even disgraceful uh, in this kind of life that leads you to uh, a loss of identity, assimilation, or in a, a very scary way, complete destruction. And in any case, negation of diaspora came to one con very clear conclusion. The future of the Jews depends on the Zionist revolution and there's no other option for Jewish existence, for the future of Jewish existence. Now this concept was held by Zionist political leaders thinkers, writers, poets, both from the left side of politics and the right side. However, one uh, has to say that there were different ways of understanding this idea. Of course, there were extreme interpretations of it, but also one can find um, ideas, understandings of, the, of life in diaspora in a more conservative way looking at the uh, coexistence of Jewish life in Eretz Israel within Zionism and Jewish life in diaspora in a, in a com complicated way. Um, and thus a uh, perspective, one might call it a conservative one, was really in search for the special qualities Jewish life had in diaspora. Um, a, a basic sense of a relationship and maybe even love to this, uh, to this Jewish existence, and also a strong will to build bridges between the new revolutionary Jewish existence in the land of Israel and eventually the state of Israel and uh, the world that was once the Jewish world in the diaspora. So one, one of the most important figures who followed this uh, conservative approach was uh, the poet Nathan Alterman. So let me say a few um, words about him, and then we can go a little deeper into his uh, vision, the way he understood the relationship between these two uh, Jewish ex existences. So Nathan Alterman was born in Russia in 1910 uh, he moved with his family to Eretz Israel in 1925. After going through very difficult years of wandering and escaping different places in Bolshevik Russia. So we see Alterman was no Sabra. He wasn't born in, uh, in Eretz Israel, but actually from a very young age, from his childhood, he knew quite a lot about the difficulties about uh, Jewish life in, in the diaspora, in exile, in, in times of crisis. In any case, Alterman, from a very early age, took an important part in the world of poetry and journalism in Tel Aviv in the 1920s and 1930s. And in 1938, an important date for this uh, lecture, and I'll return to it uh, later on, Alterman published what is considered, considered his most important Hebrew work, and this is this book um, 
כוכבים בחוץ, uh, suppose you, one can translate it into uh, stars outside, uh, a very powerful book of a Hebrew poetry that was admired and I think still is admired by today, uh, many years late after it's been published by generations of uh, Hebrew readers. Really a very strong symbol of uh, the new um, Hebrew uh, culture that was developed within uh, Zionism. So I won't say a lot about, I won't say anything else about uh, this uh, very important book uh, of poetry. I just recommend you to uh, read it if you haven't done it yet. But I do want to return to our main uh, concern over here now. Alterman was all his life, no doubt, a Zionist and uh, very, very close for many years to David Ben-Gurion, the leader of the Zionist movement during the 1930s, 40s, and onwards after the creation of the establishment of the, the Israeli state. And if one can say that David Ben-Gurion held a very a strong negative attitude towards life, Jewish life in diaspora, um, Nathan Alterman saw things a little differently. Uh, in the next few minutes, I want to read with you two poems Alterman wrote as uh, responses to the Shoah during the 1940s. And I think these two poems demonstrate uh, in a very deep way Alterman's love to Jews who lived in the diaspora, the respect he had for Jewish life in diaspora, and, and also his um, poetic uh, cultural uh, um, hope that one can build a bridge between the Jewish life that once existed and the new Jewish life that was or is being created uh, within Zionism in Eretz Israel. So um, the first poem we read in a read in a minute or two was written in uh, Tel Aviv in the 1940s. One can really imagine Alterman sitting in a cafe in a in one of the streets in Tel Aviv. And by this time, a news of the destruction of Jews in East Europe was reaching uh, Hebrew newspapers. People were, were starting slowly to understand that something beyond any imagination was happening uh, within this great war between uh, Nazi Germany and, uh, and Russia. And uh, as you will see this uh, poem um, is really a beautiful tribute to, a, to the work of Shalom Aleichem, the great uh, Jewish Yiddish writer who is, was probably the most famous um, novelist to describe that Jewish life that was now being uh, completely um, uh, destroyed. So you, you can practically see over here the young Hebrew poet sitting in safety in Tel Aviv, thinking about what's happening to the Jews in East Europe, their destruction. And what comes to his mind is the world that uh, Shalom Aleichem created in his stories. So let's, uh, let's uh, read this poem together. As we always do, I'll read it in Hebrew and you can follow me uh, uh, with the English, a stanza by stanza. The translation over here is of a very close friend of mine, Ellen Rubenstein. Um, and we, I, don't, I haven't seen a, a Hebrew translation, uh, and excuse me, an English, tr English translation of this uh, a poem. So this is really original work. So the poem goes like this. Shaina Shaindel Shili Zugati Ayafa Bain Avim Alevana Nogahat Shaina Shaindel Shili Derech Leil Vesufa Beroshi 
החולם את נוגעת. בקפוטה שלי רוח ליל ממרט ושמות כובעי עלי עורף ממצח. כך הילכתי חיים, כך שוכב אני מת. כי דמותי, כך אומרים, היא בת נצח. שין השנדל שלי יורד שלג לבן, אין אדם, כולם תמו, הביני. טוב ימת, ומת מוטל בן פייסי החזן, מת האיש היקר, הדוד פיני. וגם טופה לנח, טוטוריטו התם, נח פעוט ומחייך ממוות. נצחיים הם שחוקו ובכיו של העם, לכן טופלה הוא בן על מוות. והלילה היה משרפות חכלילי, ואני צוואה לך ניסחתי. על איגרת קטנה שין השנדל שלי, וברור כי עיקר שכחתי. העיקר לך רציתי תודה להגיד שהיית לי בת זוג סבלנית, סבלנית ומכפרת. שינה שיינדל, שיחקנו קומדיה נצחית, אך גמרנו אחרת אחרת. שינה שיינדל שלי דרך ליל וסופה, בראשי ההרוג את נוגעת. שינה שיינדל שלי זוגתי היפה, במרומים הלבנה נוגעת. So what uh, what we have what do we have over here? First of all, the tribute over here of Alterman to Shalom Alechem is uh, a tribute to one of Shalom Alechem's most famous novels called Menachem Mendel. Now this is a epistolary novel, a correspondence between a husband and wife. The husband is Menachem Mendel. His wife is Shaina Shendel. Now the basic, the basic theme is that um, Menachem Mendel has left Shaina Shendel and the children in their small village. And he travels around Russia to its great cities, Kiev, then Odessa, other places. And he's trying to make a living for him, for himself, for his family, maybe even trying to make a fortune to uh, become a rich man. He does all kinds of uh, attempts to um, be involved in the world of business, but uh, basically he fails and in, a most, in the most disgraceful way one, one can imagine. So as the novel proceeds, Menachem Mendel will write a letter to Shaina Shendel describing his attempt and then his success. But in each letter, he adds, of course, a PS in Hebrew, Ikar Shachachti, I've forgotten the most important thing. And then he gives her the information that everything he's done uh, has completely failed. Now this book, Menachem Mendel, is of course uh, very funny because that's, uh, that was the gift, the quality of Shalom Aleichem to really tell a hilarious uh, story about people's or Jewish behavior. And Menachem Mendel does have uh, these mad adventures uh, which make you laugh. But as always with the Shalom Aleichem, it's also a very sad and tragic story because it shows how desperate and difficult Jewish life was in the turn of the 19th and 20th century. And in fact, Menachem Mendel didn't exist, but in the minds and hearts of uh, millions of Jews who read his adventures in Yiddish, he was the most, uh, the most existing uh, Jew around. He was really a symbol for the Jewish uh, condition at the time, and a very tragic symbol. So over here, when you, you uh, see that uh, Menachem Mendel is writing his final letter to Shaina Shendel, he also adds over here, obviously I forgot the end, because that's how this novel 
is both. So what we have over here, going a little back, is this idea Alterman has. Again, you have to imagine this. Imagine him sitting in Tel Aviv, thinking about the, the destruction of East European Jewry. He, what comes to his mind is the work of Shalom Aleichem. And what he does over here is taking uh, the a gallery of, of Shalom Aleichem's most famous characters, Menachem Mendel and Shena Shendel, first of all. But then Menachem Mendel, who has now been uh, killed by the Nazis, murdered, he explains to his wife in his final letter you, that she must understand Tuvia, the dairyman, of course, very famous, is dead. And the child, Motel Ben Paisi Achazan, the great uh, unfinished novel by Shalom Aleichem describing the great immigration of Jews to America, is also dead. And his uncle, Pinye Pini, also dead. So Alterman is trying to say over here to his Hebrew audience, not, not Yiddish readers, that um, we know very well these people. They are our people, our family, our loved ones. We grew up with them, some of us, when we were young, before we left to Eretz Israel. Some of us knew them only through the books, but we know very clearly that when they die, when they are murdered, we in some way uh, die too. I want to move now to the second poem. Um, and uh, really it uh, speaks uh, for itself, I think. I don't, I don't want to say uh, a lot after I finish reading it. And uh, maybe I'll be very happy to hear your reflections and thoughts about it. Um, but I will give a very short introduction to the poem we are about to, to read together. So um, in many pieces of Yiddish uh, folklore and poetry, in modern times, mainly in the 19th century, we find uh, a symbol of a tree, a, a description in, in all kinds of writings, uh, songs, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, um, of some kind of tree. And the tree is always uh, standing alone on the side of a road or on a cross road. It's usually in the winter. He has no leaves. Uh, birds that once sat on his branches uh, have left him. And there are no people around him, people who, are, who want to enjoy his shade, or rest next to it. Uh, there's no one, no one there. The tree is always alone, deserted. Um, and it, it seems very clear that this tree was developed in all these works of art into a very powerful symbol of, of uh, the stress that, that Jewish life was going through through in in the in East Europe towards the the end of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century. One of the most famous versions of this image of this uh, tree standing alone appeared in 1938 the same year uh, when Alterman published uh, his famous book, Kochavim Bachut, Stars Outside, Alterman is beginning a new period um, of uh, Hebrew writing, Hebrew culture in Eretz Israel. But at the same year, maybe the most famous Yiddish poet in East Europe, Itzik Mangel, left Europe because he understood that um, war was going to come and with, and with, with a, a great trouble for the Jews. And he wrote a, probably the most famous version of this, of this Yiddish poem, the Yiddish idea about the tree left alone. And the very famous uh, opening sentences in Yiddish are, 
אויפן וייג, שטייטה בויים, שטייטר איינגה בויינגן, א' פייגל פונם בויים, זיינן זיך צפלויינן. So, I bent three stands on the road and all its birds have flown away. And he himself, the poet, Itzik Mangel, is one of those birds who's now flying away from the places he was born to a new world because uh, this existence is facing uh, complete destruction. So let's look um, at what Alterman does, what does a great symbol from Yiddish uh, poetry. And again, um, he's writing this in Hebrew for a Hebrew audience. Um, but you have to, I'm encouraging you to try and feel the way he's trying to build a bridge between the Yiddish text, which is very well known, and um, the Hebrew text, which is describing um, the historical moment, the historical drama. So this uh, poem uh, is really um, talking about the Hapala, the illegal immigration of the Shoah survivors from Europe to Palestine, to Eretz Israel, between 1945 and 1948. Of course, um, the British uh, rule didn't allow this movement and uh, was chasing these refugees on sea. And Alterman, in many other writings, understood this movement as something that resembles uh, Yetziat Mitzrayim, Exodus, in the book of, uh, in, in Shmot, a very important uh, stage or moment in the Zionist, uh, in, in the history of Zionism. So I'll read, uh, read again, um, I hope uh, slowly enough, I'll read the Hebrew and you can follow me um, with the English. And again, the translation is a original one by my dear friend, uh, Alan Rubenstein. Al em haderech etz amad, amad nofel apayim. Numa ben halayla rad, ליל סער על המים. הס ילד, הספינה על צד, נוטה מזה אפרוח. על אם הדרך עץ עמד, אין ציץ ואין תפוח. אל זה העץ אי פעם בן, אבי עמך הגיע, וצל ערבית בעץ קינן, ובד who lo henya kavash וכשהיה כאש אדום השוט אחד מחרב, צנח אביך ארץ אדום לעת מנחה עם ערב. צנח ממזבחו לאט פניו לירושלים. הס ילד, הספינה על צד, קורעה, נושקת מים. קורעת הספינה על צד, עולה שלופת ציפורן, <coughs> עליהם הדרך עץ נחרט, נחרט ויהי לתורן. הס ילד, שער התהילה, לתורן ייפתח, גם היום עמוד תפילה, גם היום מזבח. עליהם הדרך עץ עמד, ולא יפול אפיים. הס ילד, הספינה על צד, חותרה, בוקעת מים. So, as I said, it's difficult for me to add uh, anything else to these uh, extremely powerful words. So I'll just say really a short thought, thought or two, and then uh, Tamar, maybe we can uh, have a, 
a little conversation about those. Uh, we see over here that Alterman takes the symbol of the tree, really the existence of Jews in the Galut, in the diaspora. And um, the tree is a place where the grandfather of this young child, maybe even baby, that is on, of course, on a boat, on a ship with his mother uh, towards El Atisrael. Um, the tree was a place where his grandfather uh, prayed Tfilat Mincha with his face to Yerushalayim. And the tree was also the place where his father was tied to and, um, and murdered. Of course, this is the Shoah itself. But the transformation Alterman brings over here with, with him to this uh, Yiddish idea into the Hebrew text is the, that the tree doesn't stay where it stood alone. Someone took it and it now serves as a mast for the boat that's making it, that is making its way uh, uh, on sea towards Eretz Israel. And the gates of glory are going to open, are going to be open for this young child but it will be open also for this must. I think this is one of the most um, uh, beautiful examples of a way to build uh, in a very gentle and poetic way, but very deep, I think, to build a bridge between the new revolutionary existence of Jews in Eretz Israel with the Zionist movement and all the world they left behind, a world that one still has to feel a connection to love for it and um, keep it with him, with the, the creation of uh, this new kind of life. Thank you very much, Israel. I think Natal Alterman is definitely well known in Israeli society, but you've managed to um, show different sides of him and this very inspiring. And we do have some questions that came up. Um, Robert Silverman would like to know if Shalom Alechem wrote in Hebrew as well as Yiddish. Um, he did make a few attempts to write in Hebrew, mainly in his, um, his early work, but most of his work, definitely his most powerful work, well known, well read, all his bestsellers were in Yiddish. Um, I, have, I want to add the two important facts that maybe aren't well known. Shalom Aleichem was a, a Zionist from the days of Herzl until he, he died in 1916. And again, um, Zionists who came to love in, uh, in Eretz Israel, many of them came from East Europe, so they knew Yiddish, this was the mother tongue. And although they were now committed to the new society and new culture, they, many, many of them knew very well what Alterman was writing about. They knew Menachem Mendel, they knew Tuvia, they knew Motel Ben Pesi. So he was really explaining something to many people who knew exactly what the, the issue was. I'm afraid to say it's not probably not the situation in uh, Israel today. I assume less know about these figures, but uh, one must uh, do as much as he can to keep them uh, in memory today. Um, here's some questions from Brenda. Hey, Brenda. Um, do any Israeli poets compare Shoah victims to sheep to the slaughter? And she also wants to know if, if, if these poets say to the Jews, why don't you come before the war? Okay, so of course it's a very important and, and, and difficult question. I'll say a few things about it. First of all, it's true that in a wide historical perspective, the fact that the small uh, yeshuv in Eretz Israel, which the Zionist movement was able to create until the 1940s, the fact that this uh, entity didn't have enough power 
ready to help Jews in Eastern Europe is a great tragedy. The movement was built for, for almost 50 years, but when it reached that historical crisis, still didn't have enough power to help the majority of the Jews. So that's one thing to keep in mind, and it is a tragedy. Um, I know that maybe some of you have read this. There are historians in the last generation who try to say that, in fact, Ben Gurion and the Zionist establishment had some kind of, of interest not to help the East European Jewry, but um, I don't think that's true. Um, so that's, that's one thing to keep in mind. Another thing to remember is that it's true that um, during the 1950s and 1960s, until the Eichmann trial, maybe until the Yom Kippur war, um, uh, there was a very, there, was, there were difficulties. Um, the, all the, between everything that has to do with the relationship between uh, Jews who were born in Eretz Israel or came before and those who came after, what, what did the, the natives think about those who just came? And this whole dimension of silence, right? Many of the, of the survivors don't want to say anything, keep it a, a secret, keep it aside, sort a new life. So of course, there's a lot of literature and films and research about this very difficult situation. And to answer the question directly, yes, we do have poets, educators, politicians that did come up with this idea of a tzon latevach, sheep to the slaughter, etc., etc. But that's only one uh, um, direction to go. And Alterman for sure didn't uh, agree with that. He always tried to look at the experience of Jews in the Shoah in a very complex way, um, understanding the, the terrible situation, definitely admiring um, the young rebels, etc., etc., but also giving a lot of um, um, credit to just mothers and grandparents and young children who try to survive without fighting with weapons, but trying to save their lives or their dignity within the Shoah. Alterman was well aware of this already in the 1950s, many years before it became like a um, mainstream thought in uh, Israeli education and Israeli culture. Thank you. I must mention that uh, the tree is an important symbol in Judaism. Uh, it's a claim. Uh, and he said that Nathan Zach also uses it as a symbol of becoming stronger. Um, Nathan Zach, Nathan Antelman is a, is a famous uh, story. Do you want to um, answer this um, comment? Okay, so, so yes, of course, um, using um, uh, the metaphor or the symbol of the tree is very powerful over here, and we can take it to many directions. Um, mm -hmm. But I'll say something about last week. We read together the anthem of Beitar by Jabotinsky. And Jabotinsky uses of the, um, the word Geza. You come lanu Geza. And today in Hebrew, the sounds wrong because Geza or Gizanut is racism. So one wants to accuse Jabotinsky of racism because he used the word Geza in Beitar's anthem. But the truth is, he didn't have that in mind at all. Jabotinsky for sure wasn't a racist. He was a, 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 a liberal for sure. But he was thinking about a tree, a, a Geza, not in the meaning of race, but as a, a, a tree trunk that will, a new tree that will be, uh, that will grow in Eretz soil. So there's another use of that metaphor. Um, I don't want to go too deep into the great uh, dispute between Nathan Zach and Nathan Alterman. As you said, Tamar, Zach actually based his career as a young poet um, with this idea that Alterman is old fashioned and we, knew, we do need now a new Hebrew, uh, modern Hebrew, modern poetry uh, that's in many ways released from the national perspective to something much more personal. 
Um, so that's a big issue for itself, but it's true that, um, and this is a nice thing to say uh, in the week of Tu Bishvat, that using a tree to demonstrate or to discuss Jewish existence is something that we can really understand from the days of Tanakh and onwards. A few questions referred to Magasha Kesef, and they'd like to know if uh, you consider this Altersman greatest work. For sure. Magasha Kesef, um, if, if the course was, was longer, we definitely re read it out together. Um, but Magasha Kesef, the silver plate, is actually a poem that really celebrates only um, Sabra Hebrew youth and its sacrifice in the War of Independence in 1948, right? These young uh, killed, a young boy, a young girl were killed, probably fighters for the Palmach. Uh, they were the silver plate which the Jewish state was uh, given on to the Jews. So that wouldn't be a, a good example for showing Alterman's um, empathy and love to Jewish life uh, in the diaspora and that was destructed in the Shoah. That's another dimension of his work. Um, by the way, very disputed today in the modern uh, contemporary Israeli culture. If, if, if it's a good song, a bad poem, we won't get into, let's not get into it. However, if one would only read that poem but by Alterman, he might have the, he might develop this idea that Alterman was completely focused only on the new Hebrew. And of course, Magasha Kesef is probably the most powerful manifest of this idea. But if you look in a wider perspective, you can easily see that Alterman had many other things in mind in his historical worldview. And when you, you put these two perspectives together, you really come up with something very uh, deep and complex, I think. I think we'll take one last question. Um, was Nathan Altman criticized by Israeli society for the way in which he looked at diaspora Jewry, not negating Jewish life outside of Israel? Um, yes. During the 1950s, some extremists from different uh, parts of uh, Hebrew politics or culture um, did, um, have, did criticize this uh, approach he developed. Um, but he, and those are things he would write in the newspapers and get responses and write back, but really in a very um, deep way and maybe even with some kind of a courage he emphasized this idea, which wasn't easy, always for a very proud uh, Israeli audience, but he insisted that this was the really right um, and justified way to, lo to look at a Jewish existence. 